In May of 2010, 16-year-old Khalif Browder was walking home from a party in the Bronx when he was stopped by the police and arrested for robbery. With his family unable to make the $10,000 bail, he was hauled off to one of the toughest jails in the country, Rikers Island. He would then spend the next three years there locked up for a crime he never committed. In June of 2013, all the charges were dropped. So why did it take over three years for prosecutors to determine that they didn't have a case against Khalif? Well, Khalif and his attorney, Paul Prestia, are here right now demanding answers. They join us at HuffPost Live. Welcome both to you. Hello, Mark. Khalif, I want to start right with you. Uh, what happened that night? Well, on that night, I had came from a party on 3rd Avenue with some friends, and I was going home, and that's when I was stopped by police officers, and they, had, they was explaining to me that there was a guy in one of their police cars that was saying that I allegedly robbed them, and they had searched me, and the guy I actually said, at first he said I robbed him, and I didn't have anything on me. And that's you when say nothing, you mean no weapon and none of his no property? No weapon, no money, anything he said that I allegedly robbed him for. So the guy actually changed up his story and said that I actually tried to rob him, but then another police officer came and they said that, that um, I robbed him two weeks prior. And then they said, we're going to take you to the precinct and most likely we're going to let you go home. And then I never went home. They took me to the precinct and I was there. So you go to the precinct, you're photographed, you get your mug shot. You get fingerprinted. Yes. And they told you that you could post bail. Yes, that's correct. Ten thousand dollars. Yes. And of course. I, I couldn't make that. Hmm. My family couldn't pay it. So you went to Rikers Island, and did they attempt? What was the next step? Did you? Did they try to get you an attorney, uh, public well, defender? What happens there? Well, my family tried to get me a public. Um, well, tried to get me a lawyer, but my family was doing. Um, they was going through some hard times at the time, so they couldn't post bail or either get me a lawyer. So I was handed um, a legal aid, a legal um, attorney. So after that, I had to leave my, my case in his hands. It wasn't the best choice, but it was the only choice I had. Absolutely. Had you, did you have a record going into this? No. So you had, you had you been arrested before at all? No. So you hadn't been arrested. You had no convictions then. Obviously, if you hadn't been arrested, there's no conviction. And you're in Rikers Island now, charged with, what were the formal charges against you? Robbery, robbery in the second degree. Robert, robbery in the second degree. And no explanation is given to you. What did your attorney tell you when he saw this case? Well, he actually told me, well, he just showed me the evidence that they supposedly had on me, which was the dude saying that I robbed him, his statement. And I told him I didn't do this. I don't know how I'm here. He said he's going to work on the case. But after a while, I just kept hearing the same thing from the whole three years and I just learned to cope with just just being in there and that was that was rough I already knew I don't, after a while I just gave up hope three years it's a long time I mean did you find it odd I mean that you know month after month is going by and there's no updates there's no hearing there's nothing I mean it wasn't that strange even when you talk to other prisoners who were in there I mean yes. It was it was weird from from the first day I was in there. From the first day they put the um, handcuffs on me, it was weird for me. I mean, because I knew I didn't do it, and then I don't know this dude, and then I know that they're not. I felt like the police wasn't conducting their job correct. So I knew from the first day I was in there that, it, that everything was wrong. But it was it was hard knowing that for the whole three years, which was very hard. And then it came to the fact. I mean, it came to the point when they offered me time served. And that was that. That's when it really got real, real stressful for me. Cause being in there for about 33 bumps, and you, you, you miss everything. Everything about being home, the fresh air, your family, certain events. You want to be home, and then when they give you an offer to go home right then and there, it's like, I want to go home, but then you know you didn't do it, so you don't want to plea, take the plea and say that you do it. It's not right. So, so what happened is... Let, let, me, let me set this up for okay. our viewers, some who don't know the entire situation. After 33 months, right. uh, they come to Khalif and offer him a plea a deal where he would admit to committing the crime in exchange for a, a reduced sentence. And because he'd already served 33 months in Rikers Island, he would essentially have time served. In other words, he would go home having served his time for a crime that he would admit that he committed. As you're saying, that's a heck of a choice to make. Yes. You're, you're sitting there saying, I know I didn't do this, but I want to go home. And yes. you've already been sitting in prison for three years. And if you go take this to trial, yes. you were facing a lot more than the three years you'd already served. You of were course. facing up to what? Up to 15 years. Up to 15 years. So you had to choose between 
being in prison for up to 15 years and going home right then by admitting you did a crime you didn't do. That's correct. You're a better man than me, man. How, you, you made a decision that you were going to fight this. That's correct. How'd you come to that conclusion? Because I know deep down inside in my heart, I didn't do I didn't feel at least com comfortable do, um, saying that I did it. I, I wasn't going to say that I did a case that I didn't do. Why? For the simple fact that I felt like I was done wrong. I felt like something needed to be done about this. I felt like something needs to be said. If I just cop out and say that I did it, nothing's going to be done about it. I didn't do it. No justice is served. Nobody hears nothing at all. I, ha I felt like I had to fight. I had to fight. How much of a struggle was that for you, though? Because there was part of it was saying, I want to see my family. I want to he hear some, some music again. I want to feel the fresh air again. I want to see my friends again. I want to wear some different clothes again. I want to eat right. a good meal again. I want to, you I know. Mean, I mean, it was real stressful. I mean, I, there was times. I, there was nights when I couldn't go to sleep because all I thought about was when I go home, what would, what would be the first thing I would do. There was times when I had cried myself to sleep and it, it, was, it, it was hard, the whole thing. And, and, and being in there with the correction officers and them making my stay even harder, it, that, that, was, that was one of the main things that had me stressed because that, that, that court date that they had told me that if I say I did, I could go home. Is, is the same day that I came back from court and I had gotten a, a little petty argument with a correction officer and he had starved me, so it's like... You said he starved you? Yes, I was what, starved. Explain that. There are a lot of people here who don't understand what happens in prison. Well, at the time, I was put in solitary confinement because I was jumped by the correction officers and they said that I had allegedly assaulted them first, so they had put me in solitary confinement. And in solitary confinement, they control your food and how much food you get. And when it's time for feeding, they give you your food. So if you if you if you say anything that could tick them off in any type of way, some of them, which is a lot of them, what they do is they starve you. They they won't feed you, and it's already hard in there because if you get the three trays that you get every day, you're still hungry because I guess that's part of the punishment. So if they starve you one tray, that 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 could really make an impact on you. And how much were you starved? I, I, I was starved a lot. I can't even. I can't even count. But the worst, the worst, the worst time I was starved is when they starved me for four times in a row. They starved me breakfast, lunch, dinner, and breakfast again. Wow. And finally, it took. It took because I was trying to tell the captains and the superiors, the rest of the superiors, about what, was, what they was doing. But nobody wanted to listen to me, and nobody wanted to help me. And it, it finally, I finally came across the captain that that heard me out and and fixed the problem, make sure I was a. I, I was fed. And even the shower, they was denying me a shower in there too. So in the midst of all of that, being starved, being prepared for, or, or, or exp exposed to all sorts of violence, you're faced with the choice of you can leave here right now, yes, or you can f continue to fight this thing. And you made the decision to continue to fight it. How scared were you that the outcome wouldn't be good? I was petrified. I was petrified. I, I, I was, because I already knew if I, if I get up to 15, the jail I was in is bad already, as it is, the whole thing is bad. So I already knew that if jail is bad, just imagine if they send me to one of them upstate prisons. I've never even been there, so it, it was very scary, I mean. How scared were you in general population on a day to day? Petrified all day. I, I was scared all day because I didn't know where it would come from. I don't know any, where any harm would come. I've seen a lot of things being done to people in there. and. I, I didn't know if I was going to be next for it. I seen people getting jumped. I seen people getting cut and, and hit with weapons and all, chairs, all type of stuff. So it, it's scary. And I, I, wasn't, I wasn't friends with a lot of people in there. So when you don't got friends, it's really scary because you don't know what anybody would do to you. And they know you don't got nobody to back you up. So. Yeah. Now, now this is a delicate question. And, and if you don't want to talk about this at this point, I totally understand. But. Um, there were points where you attempted suicide. Is yes. That, is that correct? Wh how many times did that happen, and, and what were the circumstances around it? I would say I committed suicide about five to six, five or six times. Okay, you attempted suicide five to six times. Yes. While all, in, while, all while still in prison. Yes. Wow. And I, I, I try, I tried to resort to telling the correction officers that I wanted to um, see a psychiatrist or a counselor, something. I was telling them I need mental health because I wasn't feeling right. All, all the stress from my case, everything was just getting to me and I just, I just couldn't take it. I just needed somebody to talk to. I needed to just let, let, let a, I just needed to be, I just needed to talk and be stress free. But the correction officers, they didn't want to hear me out. Nobody wanted to listen. So when I tried to kill myself at, at one point, which was in 
2012 March. At one point, I tried to kill myself. How, how, what did you do? I had, I had took, I had ripped my sheets on my, um, I had ripped my bed sheets and made a noose out of it, and I had hung it to something that's on the ceiling, a light fixture, and I was about to jump, and the correction officers cracked, they opened my cell, and when I jumped, they grabbed me, they threw, they, they cut me down, they threw me on the um, bed, they had, um, gave me a lot of punches, they stomped me on the bed, they took my sheets, my books, my covers, and they stomped me for about two, three trays. Straight. So they punished you for this? Yes. They attacked you and punished you for this? Yes. Wow. And then after that, you know, because in a lot of places, the expectation would be that you'd be put on some sort of suicide watch, you'd be put into um, a mental facility that you'd be at least given some sort of treatment. Yes. They put you right back into the cell. Yes. Only, only one time that there was a, a, a suicide incident where they gave me the proper treatment that, I was, that I'm supposed to get. Only one time. And that was the last time I had tried to kill myself in there. And that was... To, that was that was about March too this wow. year. Khalif, if I were you, I would. I don't know where I would be mentally right now or emotionally. Um, how are you feeling since you? First of all, how did you feel when they when you got word that you were going home? I felt relieved. I felt like that was the best feeling I ever had in my life. Just fresh air, I'm able to see my family again, enjoy the holidays. Yeah. I'm able to do any type of fun I would like to do. It, it felt great. It was the best feeling I ever endured. This is the first Thanksgiving, Mark. He's had with his family since 2009. Oh, my God. That's a Thanksgiving indeed, man. I mean, and I'm glad you're able to enjoy it with your family. Thank you. But this isn't over, right? No, this no. This can't be. What, what, what's next? I mean, I can't, I can't really tell you what's next, but like, I feel like the whole point of me being on this show is just to get my story out there because I feel like this happens every day. Uh, this happens every day, and I feel like this got to stop because it's, I feel like there's, there's a lot of people that's in there for stuff that they didn't do, and they got to they got to be in there for about three years. And when they get off of something like me, a lot of people are, aren't strong, so they would say they would say they would take the plea deal and take it, knowing that they didn't do it. And it happens every day. Yeah, it happens every day. So I just. I don't know. Do your GED. That's are you getting, Are you seeing a therapist or psychi psychiatrist right now? Yes, right now. Okay, good. Because, I mean, that's so important for you. Now, I'm, I'm being big brother now, but oh, I want right. to make sure you get your support psychologically. I want to make sure you're do, handling school stuff, and eventually we'll get you back in the workforce as well. But right now, it's really important for you to take care of yourself. But the words you said were so important. The gratitude you offered to people um, is key. The humility and the grace with which you've handled this right. uh, is is admirable to me. There are a lot of people who would walk out of there nothing but angry. And you have a right to be angry, and you should be angry. Right. But you're also turning your pain into power by taking this story to other people. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for spending some time with me today. You're right.